Good morning. Uh, let's see, we are in Grand South for our 9.30 talk this morning with Ofer Mahor. Uh, thank you again for making it to day two of Abstract USA. Uh, I'm Rinaldi Rampin, one of the organizers. Uh, again, wanted to thank everyone for coming and our speakers. And this morning, uh, we're going to start with putting the eye in the code review by Ofer Mahor. Thank you. Uh, so I'll say it one last time. If you sit at the back, I strongly suggest you come forward. The examples are not looking very big on the screen. Um, and from here, on, so your problem. OK, so today we're going to talk about making code review interactive. And I'll get there in a second. My name is Alfred Moore. If you've never seen me or heard of me, I work at Synopsys today. Um, so we'll start our talk with a little bit of introductions. And then we'll talk a little bit about the challenge. Why do we want to do Code Review Interactive? Um, how is it different than a normal code review? And what are, you know, wh why are code reviews so hard? And then I'll start by explaining you a little bit the technique of how to do interactive code review. And we'll go to a demo. And the demo will show you uh, how to do that on a piece of fairly simple code. But you can take the technique from there. And then I'll follow about how you can actually use this technique even when you don't have the code, just based on bytecode. And we'll do a demo of that. We'll summarize and be good for questions and answers. Uh, if something's not clear during the presentation or demo, feel free to raise your hand. I don't want to run through things uh, quickly. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been doing security for over 20 years now. Uh, which is a long time, most of them in the application security space. I've been with OWASP since its foundation. I was a chapter leader of OWASP Israel, still part of the board. If you haven't seen my t-shirt, the OWASP Israel shirt. Um, OWASP Israel is one of the largest chapters uh, in OWASP. We had over 700 people in our last conference in Israel, which is almost as big as this one. Um, Israel generally is very big on AppSec. <laughs> I'm also... Um, I had a company called Seeker, which started IAST. If you've never heard about IAST, a good, interesting read. And actually, the technique I'll show you today is, in, a, in many ways, manual IAST. I've been a pen tester for many, many years. Um, the last few years, I don't do that much hands-on stuff, unfortunately. That's life. Um, and I'm also a photographer. And I never get to speak on photography. Apparently, I'm better at AppSec. But, uh, so I always take a photo. This is from my last trip to Africa in August. They have a great Milky Way in the Southern Hemisphere. So um, a few words about Synopsys. If you've never heard about us, it's because um, Synopsys started its way in a different area of, of software for chip design. But we've acquired a bunch of companies uh, in the space of software security. Uh, Coverity, which is static analysis, um, Seeker, my company, and, and a bunch of other companies. And, and essentially, we're building a platform for helping developers create secure code. Um, it's not a product pitch. So if you're interested in hearing more about us, our booth is right outside this uh, lecture hall. Come visit later. OK, let's start. So what's wrong with code review? How many people here do code reviews? Wow, that's cool. That, oh, you don't do code reviews. Come on, I know you. <laughs> um, so code reviews are, yeah. How would you define a code review? Is that manual or is it like using your eye or using the tool? Manual. When I talk about code review, I talk about manual. Otherwise, it's static code analysis. Um, so code review is hard. Right? And if you've all done code review, you know it's hard. It's very simple to review a small piece of code and seeing what it does. But when you start getting a lot of code, it gets really complicated. Trying to figure out each function, where it's being called from, and, and what it's doing, and what type of input validations were there, and what potential attack vectors get into each piece of code, it's hard. Of course, it's doable. But what happens is usually is that it takes too long. So I, I used to have a pen testing and code review company before I started my product company. And the thing is, you look at this size of code and you say, well, I need 30 days to really review that properly. 
and the customer says, well, I can't pay for 30 days, so just do it in a couple of weeks. And then you end up trying to fight and optimize and guess what is the best way to do code review. And there are so many frameworks, so many third-party components. Could be The customer could tell you, you know, it's a small piece of code, but then you discover they have 300 open source components in there, and you don't know what they do and how they behave, and you have to review them as well or hope they're good. <laughs> and so it becomes very, very complex. And of course, we have today static analysis tools that help us do that, but still, some customers uh, want to see code review a lot of times because you can really look at things that static analysis can't, more logical flaws, uh, more complex things. And so we essentially want to make code review more efficient, right? We want to bring the customer better value for money. We want to uh, get make sure that when we finish reviewing the code, we are actually um, focusing on the most important thing, on the real uh, dangerous attack vectors, on the relevant pieces of code. There's a lot of code in every application which has almost zero thread in it because it doesn't take any user input in. And even if it's badly written, it's probably not going to have any security implication. So we want to see which code can take in tainted input, which code is reached when we go from, um, when we go from a user input, what happens, which queries are made, where are the things. Uh, and make and that also works when we're using all kinds of frameworks that we don't always see where things go to eventually, right? Maybe I'm not using ODBC. Maybe I'm using some framework for managing database query. And so we came up with this technique. In, in a lot of ways, again, it's it's like manual uh, IAST, IAST interactive application security testing. But I find that it's a really useful way, um, given that you can get access to the environment, and I'll explain that in a minute, to uh, make a code review much more efficient. So at its core, this technique says, I'm going to combine looking at code while looking at the live application, so running and testing the application with a debugger. And when I use a debugger, I can see what the application is executing for each piece um, of attack that I'm sending. I send a request, and I can see what's happening. And so, does this work? No. no. Okay, so <laughs> I send an HTTP request, I open a debugger, and I can see exactly uh, line of code. How many people here have experience with debuggers? Okay, good. Good class. Um, and essentially what I do, I do a combination of penetration testing with code review. I send request, I see what's going on. So for instance, this is, I can put a breakpoint on the call for the query, right? And see the debug data. And essentially, I send a request. Okay, we'll, do it. we'll see it better in the demo. And I see it stopping on a breakpoint. And then I can see the actual query changing as I'm changing the requests. So how do we do that? So to get this done, basically what you need to do is get your Java application in debug mode. Uh, normally, if we go to a customer, we run it on an environment we already get. So we run the debugger locally, and we debug the application through the Java debug port. So if you're not familiar with that, that works the same with non-head, of course. If you're not familiar with that, Java um, allows remote debugging. There's a remote debugging protocol. It listens on port 8000 by default. You can change it, of course. And to get it done, and I'll show you that in a second, you simply edit your Tomcat config. You add the Java options that are here, Java ops, all that string. That will be, that will be available later, the presentation with all the data. And you simply restart the server, and it gets it into debug mode. And then you go to your IDE. I'll be doing the demo today with Eclipse. And um, you configure it, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, to connect to the remote debug, and you start debugging. And then you can simply send requests, see the runtime data, look at the code, and prioritize what you're testing. 
So let's go to the demo because that's more interesting and that's what you're here for. So, uh, wait, I have to quit the PowerPoint because it decided to. take over my screen. Okay. So, so this is my VM. Um, this is uh, WAVSEP. If you've never heard of WAVSEP, it's a benchmark a framework uh, for dynamic application security testing. It's just really nice, simple code, so I, I use it for the demo. It's a part of the OS VM uh, that you can see here running. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the Tomcat file. And you can see this is the Tomcat execution file. And I already added the Java options here, but you can see here it is, Java options, existing Java options, plus we're adding the uh, Java debug wire protocol. This is the port it's listening on. If you want to change it, feel free. We save and quit and then we restart the Tomcat. Okay, so now the Tomcat is up and running. It's listening on the Java uh, debug port, and I can open my Eclipse. If I can ever break out of this. No, that's... So now I, we have conflicting um, hotkeys. <laughs> hmm. Any idea what I'm doing now? Because the control alt that takes me out of the VM was captured by, oh wait, what if I do? No, it, oh, okay. Okay, we're not gonna come back to that. Okay, so um, this is Eclipse. I have a Java project here with WAVSP, right? Um, and so to get the debugging going, I need to configure, oh, sorry. I need to configure the debugger. And essentially, I created here a debug profile, which says, go to this machine, that's the IP of my VM, and port 8000. <laughs> And that's it. And then I click the debug, right? I connect to this. Oh, it's already connected. And you can see here that it's running, right? So let me open the um, WAFSAP if you've never seen that. At the moment, I have no breakpoints, right? So if I go here now, let me go, let's start with SQL injection. Okay, login failed, this is running, nothing happened, we haven't seen anything because we haven't placed a breakpoint yet. But now let's say I wanna review the code here. So I have the code here, right? This is uh, the code that runs the case I'm doing. Um, you can see that it gets the username and password, creates a query, um, right? creates this dynamic query and calls it. So let's put a breakpoint um, in the beginning here. Okay, let's put a breakpoint here. Oh, here, where it uh, first gets the first parameter from the username. Okay, I put a breakpoint, I'm going here and I'm refreshing and you see this is now waiting and now I'm here. And what I see is that the code reached this point. And now, you know, just like with any debugger, I can start going through this and seeing what happens. And it creates a connection and right stuff. And now it's starting to build the SQL string, right? So if I go here, you can see that I already have the username and password, which are text value and text value two, that I got from uh, the request, right? And as I'll step through the process where it creates the string, 
I see that the string was created, right? And I see exactly how it was created. So I, and again, this is very simple code, of course, so you, you would have guessed how it's creating it as it is. But even if it was complex, if there was input validation, anything in here, you would actually be able to see how exactly uh, the string is created, what string is generated, what string is being sent to the database. And here you can see there was no um, object in the result set. As a result, this was null. As a result, it did not get to this point, And it got here and said, login field, right? <coughs> so I'll do one more simple example, uh, just for those that want to see. Uh, oh, wait, before that. So now let's say I want to attack this, right? So let me open my burp, turn on intercept. I review that. OK. And now I'm going to change text value to x or 1 equals 1, right? So that should get me logged in. Forward. And again, we go through that. You see the yellow ones are things that are different. doesn't matter that much right now. We go through the same process. We can see now that the password successfully got that. There was no input validation in front of that, so you can feel very comfortable that your analysis of how the code is running is correct. Uh, again, create the query. And we can see that the query now holds. Uh, holds the injection, right? And so now as it will run, when we get here, we expect the if to work correctly, and indeed it does. And we can see that the login was successful, and we're done. So again, a very simple case. Uh, I'll show one more simple case with cross-site scripting, just so we can um, uh, see how this works again. Let me turn off the interception. So let's go XSS examples, uh, tag to HTML page scope. Again, I go here. Um, I turn on a breakpoint. I access the code, and I can see again how the text is working, how the code is working. Very simple. Again, this is a very simple case of cross-site scripting. But in a second, the next demo I'll show you is I'm going to show you code that's a little bit uh, more complicated. Um, play. And we see that in. Again, if I put a script alert, it would do something else. But let's look at code that's a little bit trickier. So let's look at LFI, or path traversal. So this is uh, the path traversal test, the simple path traversal test. Uh, it accesses a file. And essentially, it gets as a parameter a file name and, and just brings it out. So we can get anything with it, right? If I would put here, um, if I would put here etc pass wd, I would get etc pass wd. Very simple. Um, so where do I have this case here? Okay. So this is the LFI case. Um, if you look at the code, there's actually no file access here, right? Why is there no file access here? Because this is done here in the inclusion logic. And that's a pretty long and annoying piece of code. So I'll put a breakpoint here, actually. And let's try to see what happens here. And so it goes to the file inclusion. And if I want to see what's going on in, I can just do step into, right? And step into will go into the file. It's going first through a, a class. OK. And now we're getting to the file. The part where you saw there was no code, it because it went through some of the Java built-in classes. And we'll get there in a minute. But essentially, we didn't have, I didn't associate the source code of that with that. So the debug still works. Debugging works even in Java, even when you don't have the code. But it's not going to show you the code. And we'll talk about it later. But now I'm inside um, the input validator for 
this. And essentially, I can go, and I'm not going to go with you through all the code, but there's a lot of code here, actually, that looks at the file name and the prefixes and does all sorts of input validations. And obviously, for each of the cases, there's a variation on this, so the code behaves differently. But essentially, with this technique, you can very easily go see how the code is being executed, um, see what's happening, see and get to the point where it's eventually calling the file. It's going to take a while of steps um, to go through that. But you really see the flow. You don't have to guess anything. You don't have to read the concept. Oh, so what does this if mean? What does this, where does it get it from? You can see everything at any point. You can look at the variables, look at everything that's in the memory, and simply very quickly get an understanding of the code flow, how it works, what it does, um, and so on. Okay, so I'll play this because I don't want to go through the entire uh, demo, uh, sorry, through the entire code. So essentially, with this technique, all I have to do, I, well, I have to ask the customer to give me an actual working environment. Obviously, it's not going to replace a completely dry code review where I just get a piece of code. I need a little bit more setup from the customer. But I take the code that I have, all the files, I associate them in the debugger with the environment that I get, and I can simply go and work through the code. And Actually, when I was still doing code reviews, I used this technique a lot. And this actually um, inspired some of our ideas about how to do IS technology, because there's so much visibility that you can get here. OK, so let's go back to the presentation. Questions until now? Yes. OK, so I'll, from my experience, this approach helps me focus. It doesn't mean that I'm not doing any manual code review, but it helps me focus. When, this is a very small code base, right? I could review it in an hour. But in the real world, like you say, there's half a million lines of code. You have to figure out what calls what, what are the flows, what's happening, which part of the codes are even accessible, which part of the code is dead weight and you don't want to waste time on it, and so on. And this technique really helps you because you get to see, you get to see uh, how classes access, access each other. You get to see which um, classes and which parts of the classes take in data that originally comes from user code, okay? Because you, you look at every page and you start stepping into the classes and you can map everything. And of course, you can do that manually. It's just, this is, from my experience, more efficient to help you focus. At the end of the day, you're still going to want to review the code and see what it's doing. But this really, really helps you get focus uh, in play. OK, let's, uh, let's continue. So. This is a great technique for code review, again, in my experience. Um, it's also a great technique for interactive pen testing, even when you don't have the code. And so, uh, as you probably know, Java compiles to bytecode, which is essentially code. So as long as you have access to the debug port, you can do everything I've just shown you without actually having the code. And that really makes, um, and I use this sometimes in pen testing, it really makes it very efficient, again, to better focus what you're doing. So uh, easily monitor runtime execution information without the code. You can do that with a debugger or with instrumentation. And I'll explain later what are the advantages of instrumentation. Um, and if you use a reflector, which I won't be using in this demo, but you're using Reflector, which is essentially a piece of software that can convert bytecode back into sort of the code that it was compiled from, 
uh, then you can really do the whole debug and code review even when you don't have the code. It's great when you do audits for third parties that don't want to give you the code. It's great just to make your pen test more efficient. Today, when you do a pen test, right, you send a request, you have to guess based on the response what's going on. With this technique, you see exactly uh, what happens. <coughs> now, the biggest problem um, is that you cannot put breakpoints on the code, right? Because you don't have the code. So you can put breakpoints on the byte code, but it is actually quite annoying. And so a little bit about byte code, if you're not familiar, everything you write on, over Java ends up being compiled into byte code, which looks like the thing on the right. And this is essentially code that is very similar to what you wrote, just in another format. And this is being run by the Java machine. <laughs> and what I can do here, and that is really the fun part of this technique, and you can do that, by the way, in if you have the code too, of course, is provider level debugging. And what do I mean by that? Instead of putting a breakpoint on the line of code that you're looking at, put a breakpoint on all the common things that worry you from a security perspective. Database call, okay, I'll put a breakpoint on this. Uh, file access, okay, I'll put a breakpoint on this. Anything else, I'll put a breakpoint on anything that's interesting. And then, as I write my code, maybe I even didn't realize that it's going to another piece of the code and causing another query there. And I can just catch where things go. Because in a very large code base, stepping one line by one line can become a bit tedious. And this really helps me to catch things the way they are uh, relevant for me. So I set up a provider level breakpoint, like execute query, and I'll show you in a second how you can create your own, but also how you can get from me a file that already does all that for you. Um, and whenever there is a call to the execute query, I can intercept that, see what it's doing, and going there. Now, this technique can also be done with instrumentation. How many people here have heard about instrumentation? Not so much. So a quick word about instrumentation, also known as profiling, uh, not the racial one. Um, instrumentation is a way to insert code into code in memory on the fly. It was originally uh, built for doing performance analysis and other things around um, bytecode, works with Java, works with .NET uh, CLR. And essentially, if you look at the right, that the bytecode translates into something like that. And then with instrumentation, I can essentially inject code before or after each line of code. There are tools for those for doing that. They're called profilers. They're open source profilers. Um, I don't go into this because it's a little more complicated to create. It requires a little bit more time. Uh, the main advantage of instrumentation over a debugger is that instrumentation doesn't stop the process, right? With the debugger, you see, every time I send something, the process stops. I have to look at the debugger and say next, or you know, step into, play, whatever. And if you have a really large application that takes an input and creates 2,000 queries out of that, and I've seen those things, then it becomes a little difficult to manage with the debugger. If you use instrumentation, you just click, and it will dump a log of all the queries or whatever um, instrumentation calls you put at the provider level, and it will show you everything. You can search, you know, and it's just quicker. Um, for this demo, we're just using the debugger version, but again, feel free to look up a little bit how to use a, a profiler. It's not very complicated, and you can create your own uh, profiler profile that looks at the debugger um, at the provider level to test. <laughs> so, as I said, debugger is simple to use. It's great at identifying entry points. If you have the code, you can put breakpoints on all the entry points and all the uh, request parameters, uh, but might be limited with heavy traffic applications. Uh, profiler, a bit more complex. Um, it's a little harder to fine tune to get only the data you want. But once you set it up correctly, you can chunk through a lot of code with that. So how do we, do we create provider level breakpoints? So there are two ways to do that. Um, essentially, we need to get to a point where we see the provider being called. 
and we create a breakpoint. I'll show you now how to do that. So you can create that in your own IDE, in your own environment, with your own providers. My, my demo is just on MySQL. If you have Oracle, it will be a different provider. Um, so I'll show you how to do that, and you can just put breakpoints in the code. But if you don't want to deal with that, and for now, if you're working on MySQL uh, and you want a ready-made project, then we have a project that you can import into Eclipse that already has breakpoints for queries, uh, uh, printouts, file access, and so on. And then you just import it and you're done. But let's start by showing you how to create them. Um, okay. So, I had an Eclipse. Okay, Eclipse. <laughs> so let me go back to the SQL injection demo. Okay, so I'm clicking this, right, like we did before, but the purpose now is not to debug the application, but just to create the provider level um, breakpoint. Okay, so we get here, I need to get to the point where we run the query, right? Oh. So I'm getting to, um, I'm missing a window. Yeah. Sorry? So I closed my outline. Gosh, I hate Eclipse. Um, does anybody remember how I sh opened my outline window? Let's get back to the relevant line of code first. No, I want to see the outline so I can, it's not a variable, it's a window, oh. Ah, yeah, okay, here it is. So, Oh, yeah, I need to step into, that's what, uh, so now I step into this, okay? And I step into the get execute, and it opened me the object of the delegating statement, which is the object that does that. And as I go here, you see, I see execute query. So delegate statement is the object, execute query is what actually calls the query. And what I do is I toggle method breakpoint. Right? I go here. I can do this on additional, um, on execute it as well, because sometimes people use it with execute query and sometimes with execute. Where is that? Here. Okay. So now, let's do this again. I'm going to remove the breakpoint that I originally had for this query, okay? I, I no longer use the breakpoint that is on my source code. I only have now the breakpoints that are on this. Now, I'm refreshing this, and what you can see is that I stopped in delegating statement execute query, right? So I don't know which part of the code it was, it, but it stopped wherever it gets a query. And I can look here, and I can see that this gets data that comes from the user, right? Because I sent this request. And then I can go and I can start climbing up the stack. And obviously, it immediately shows me the next thing on the stack is the code. So if you have large code bases, you can really use that to find potential syncs and go through that, even if you have, even if you have the source. 
But I also want to show you what to do when you don't have the source at all, right? So if you don't have the source at all, you need to import a set of breakpoints you already created. So let me quit my Eclipse. I'm going to open a new workspace. This workspace doesn't have the source code, okay? Okay, so it doesn't have the source code, and I still connected here. You can see I have a bunch of um, a bunch of stuff here. Let me open again the queries, all the um, database connection. And if you look at my Java project, it's an empty Java project. I don't have any source code. It's just for the debug providers. And if you want, as I said, you can later come. I'll send you a zip file that has the project, has the uh, breakpoints, and you can simply import it to your Eclipse. And I can now go and start debugging. And everything I do stops at the execute query. And you can see that as I go up the stack, it tells me this comes from this JSP line, line 41, but you don't have the code for it. And it's fine. If you want, you can add the code. If you also want, you can um, install a reflector that will pull that binary and show you a pseudocode of what was done. And with this way, you can go and debug everything. So back to our slide. So, strengths and weaknesses. When is this good? When is this bad? Um, I think my experience and a lot of projects we've done, this makes a pen test or a code review or some combination or whatever gray box, white box test you want to do more efficient. It helps you find the code. It helps you see what you do. Um, it helps you focus on the input vectors, on the inputs that go to sinks. <coughs> And it's pretty simple to use. I mean, if you've never worked with a debugger, it might take you a bit to get used to it, but it's really simple to use. So what are the weaknesses? Um, it requires a running application. So if a customer just wants to dump a zip file on you with code, you're probably not going to be able to build the application yourself and run it in 99% of the cases. So you need help from the customer to get you an environment, and you need to be able to access that runtime environment, right? You need to configure the Tomcat, restart. So it's really just for test environment. Another problem which I didn't write here is that a lot of times customers will get confused and they'll send you a wrong version of the code compared to the uh, environment that you get. So it really requires a little bit of cooperation from R&D, which I know is not something we always get when we do projects. Um, but there's a part of, of customer education here as well you should explain your customer that this gives him more value for money when he does, when he hires you. Sometimes it will help and they will cooperate. <coughs> and so it's a little harder to do than just a pen test or just a code review, but the results are much better in our experience. Questions? There's, is there somebody on the mic? You'll be the room volunteer. Oh. Uh. So um, the presentation is great. Thank you. Um, going through a, a standard engagement that you would have with a, a customer, with a client, or in-house, um, when would you pull this out of your toolbox to really make it the most effective uh, of using, using these techniques and also the most effective use of, of time? So, for one, it's usually not your first engagement with a customer. Uh, again, from my experience, it's been a while since I've been selling penetration tests and code reviews, but uh, usually when a customer retains you for the first time or retains penetration testing for the first time, they, are, they really want to see a punch and a penetration testing is the thing. But at the time where they become more mature, and they want code reviews or grade box tested, uh, 
then you can start talking about this. We would bring this up every time a customer wants a code review. We would always say, this is more efficient than a code review. It's, it's a code review, but with higher efficiency. Are you willing to do the extra mile to set it up and get us the environment? And it would work in maybe half the cases. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if, uh, in your experience with your customers, do their developers actually do this kind of stuff? And do they have the security know-how to recognize that they, they've got an SQL injection in your example? Okay, so that's a, a, a bigger question. So developers do that kind of stuff for sure. They work with debuggers all the time. Uh, they don't do it for security, though. Uh, there are developers that understand security, and generally the the challenge of making developers more aware of security is a big challenge that we're all working with. Uh, the term shift left is the term I heard a lot in the last couple of days in this conference. Um, we do a lot of developer training. We try to teach developers uh, how to better use tools and techniques like that. It's, uh, it's a challenge. And some organizations are more mature, um, some are less. I assume to, you know, sort of automate where you've had your little JSP test pages that you launched from. I assume you would, you would, you would sort of have a, a dictionary of payloads in those, uh, that correlates out to the, the profiler so that it could catch those. What do you mean? I'm not sure. So like I'm doing string SQL injection, right? You had just a, a link that did, you know, or you changed, you changed it manually, right? In the, you know, via, via, Burp. Uh, yeah, burp. So, um. Oh, if I had, but, so right. that, that depends. I mean, if I go to. In an automation, from an automation standpoint. If I use a profiler, I might use an automation to generate requests and see and collect the data. If I use a debugger, I'd be working manually. Yeah, anyway then you'd be because, manually. Yeah, that's why I said profiler. But, but you can do this so. manually. I mean, you don't need automation for that. You can use manual, uh, requests like you do in a pen test. You open burp suite, you send a request, you modify something and you look how it's in the debugger. So then follow up to that or, or slightly different question. Have you found customers that would then say, oh, well, we, because I mean, I'm a 16 year developer turned apps at consultant. So, you know, yeah, I debug them port 8000 all the time. Uh, have you found that they said, oh, well, we do this and then adopted it into their practice? I wouldn't say I found people that adopted it from a security code review simply because they don't have the skill set. I mean, they could run debug port 8000, but do they know what to look for? Do they know which payloads to put? Do they know how to do that? There are organizations that um, do internal code reviews, of course, and some of them might actually be using some of these techniques. But most of the organizations that retain an external company for code reviews because they don't have the know-how. So having the technique is cool, but you still need to know what to look for in the code. And that requires a professional. All right, well, let's thank Ofer for a great talk. Thank you.